Okay, we're recording. Okay, it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Aaron Bauer. So Aaron is from New York originally, where he got to play a lot in the woods as a kid and learned a lot about herps at that point. Um, from there, he went to, as he was just discussing with one of our colleagues, to uh, Michigan State University, where he got a degree and then went on to Berkeley, where he got his PhD. Um, Aaron then went and got his postdoc at the University of Calgary, and since then has come to us at Villanova, where he's the Lamole Endowed Professor, as well as being one of the senior scientists at our Center for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Stewardship, CBEST, through whom this seminar series is being offered in collaboration with a bunch of people from Grow Oakwell. So we're really excited to have this biodiversity in your neighborhood seminar series. You know, I think that there's so many amazing um, people in our community that know so much about biodiversity. And so, you know, it's fun to interface with them. And it's also really fun to hear from our experts, particularly Aaron, who at this point, and it's really hard to keep count, but he's published, I think, 600 articles. Um, he gets cited about 2,000 times a year, which for someone in ecology and evolution is a pretty amazing number. His, it, his work's having an incredible impact on his field. He's described over 150 species at this point, um, and his work is really around the world. He and his students and postdocs and collaborators work in Namibia and Angola and Australia, South Africa. Um, and really, he has amazing titles at lots of different institutions, including Harvard, the U U.S. National Museum, um, and others. And I think the coolest, what I was saying to Aaron, is one of his coolest titles is that he's the extraordinary professor of zoology at the Univer University of Stellenbosch in South Africa. In South Africa, which is a pretty cool title because he is truly extraordinary and I'm really lucky to call him um, a colleague and friend. And so with that, I will allow Aaron to take over the seminar and I'll mute and turn off. Are you good, Aaron? Uh, I'm good. Can everybody see the screen? Yes. Yep, you're good. We can see it. Okay. Um, so I will go ahead. Thank you for that, that undeserved glowing, uh, uh, introduction. Uh, so I want to talk specifically today about herps of the main line. Um, and I came to Villanova in, uh, 1988. So I've been 35 years living on, living, working on the main line. So although my work is mostly in the old world tropics and in the Southern hemisphere, um, I have tried to keep my, my eye open to herps around, uh, around Villanova and the surrounding areas. Um, so first off, I thought since we have a diversity of people here with different backgrounds, um, that I would say something about the difference between amphibians and reptiles. So we've got on the left side of the screen, the major groups of reptiles, some of which will be familiar to everybody, things like snakes and crocodiles and turtles. There's also another group, tuataras, which only occur in New Zealand. And for amphibians, we've got salamanders, frogs and toads, and Sicilians, which are a limbless group, tropical group, that maybe most of you don't know much about since we don't really have them here. Uh, the groups that have the X's on them here are ones that are not in Pennsylvania. I'd be very surprised if you found a Sicilian or a native uh, crocodilian here, but they, they are not. But we do have all the other groups. We have frogs, salamanders, turtles, snakes, and lizards. So I, I wanted to start with a little comparison between amphibians and reptiles. Um, both are ectothermic. Both are so-called cold-blooded. They get most of their of their uh, energy needs from the surrounding environment. But they differ in a lot of different things. Amphibians have smooth, moist, glandular skin. Reptiles have scaly, mostly dry, aglandular skin. Amphibians are dependent on water for reproduction. Reptiles are have amniotic eggs that are waterproof. Um, amphibians often, not all, but often undergo metamorphosis. Ooh. Sorry, I left the T out of metamorphosis, um, whereas reptiles are generally born or hatch as sort of miniature adults. Uh, and amphibians form a natural group or an evolutionary group. They're all each other's closest relatives. 
And reptiles don't because birds are embedded within reptiles. Birds are more closely related to crocodilians and to turtles uh, than they are to, uh, or than crocodiles or turtles are related to lizards or snakes. And the groups actually separated from each other about 350 million years ago. So if that's the case, why are they often lumped together? Why do people talk about amphibians and reptiles? Why is there a field called herpetology, which combines amphibians and reptiles? So there's several main reasons for, uh, for this. Um, one is that both are ectothermic and that aspect of being sort of cold blooded um, is a primitive feature that, that we see across vertebrates as a whole. And people have interpreted that as being important because we're mammals, we're not ectothermic. Being ectothermic was a feature of being something different, of being something other. And so uh, people group them for that reason. The other reason is a sort of historical accident. Linnaeus, who's shown here with his famous work, Systema Naturae, um, Linnaeus didn't care much for amphibians and reptiles. He considered them mean and lowly creatures. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, he didn't pay much attention to them. He, he lumped them together. And it was really almost another hundred years before the scientific community completely separated amphibians and reptiles from one another. But it's really just a Two Aaron, different I'm groups. sorry. I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt you for one second. I'm so sorry. Sure. Can everyone please mute themselves if they haven't yet? That would be great. Thank you so much. Sorry, Aaron, to interrupt. Go ahead. Sure, no problem. Um, so the uh, it's really a, a number of reasons why amphibians and reptiles have been placed together, but in fact, um, they're they're sort of a a group of convenience rather than a real group in in nature. Nonetheless. Like many people who are interested in one of the groups, I'm also interested in the other. And so we're gonna to continue to talk about, about herpetology and talk about amphibians and reptiles together. So I thought I'd start uh, as Kel did in his talk on bats by saying a little bit about the importance of amphibians and reptiles uh, in terms of general ecology. So because they have low energy, they're inactive when it's hot or cold, they don't have to maintain a high metabolic rate. Things like mammals and birds are expending a huge amount of energy just to keep their temperature uh, at, a, at a set level. Uh, because they don't need to do this, the environment can often support very large numbers of individuals of amphibians and reptiles. And in fact, some herb species can have a greater biomass than the much larger birds and mammals in which they live, uh, with which they live. So we can have even though we think of deer as sort of maybe the biggest things that we have running around in our backyards, the biomass of salamanders can actually exceed the biomass of deer in some places. Uh, other ecological roles we can mention, that they're important consumers of a lot of different things. Amphibians in general and lizards are consumers of insects and spiders as well as other things. Uh, rodents, small vertebrates, crustaceans are taken by different species of snakes fish, carrion, and plant material by turtles. And there are exceptions to the rule. Almost everything that can be eaten is eaten by some species of amphibian or reptile. So they're deeply embedded in various food webs. Another role is that they are sensitive indicators of water quality. Many amphibians and reptiles are either entirely dependent on water or partially dependent on water. Uh, and uh, because of that, when water quality decreases, we see the loss or fragmentation of habitat. And most of the species that have fragmented distribution, most of the amphibians and reptiles with a fragmented distribution, and nearly all of the ones that are threatened or endangered in Pennsylvania have suffered because of habitat loss or other anthropogenic threats. And that includes things like water pollution, pollution of various sorts, introduced predators, and a variety of other things. Um, so, it stands to reason if we see a diverse herptofauna, we have uh, signals of a healthy ecosystem. If we see that we have a lot of amphibians and reptiles, it generally is saying something positive about what the environment is like. So I wanted to give you a, uh, a little overview of how many amphibians and reptiles there are in the world and in the US before we jump into Pennsylvania. So if we take a look at amphibians, there are eight and a half thousand species worldwide, about 350 in the US. 
divided in the different groups as indicated. And the things that are in parentheses, in case you're wondering about that, those are additional introduced species, non-native species. In reptiles, there are almost 12,000 species worldwide, uh, 376 plus 110 introduced species in the US. So for reptiles, introduced species is an actual significant problem, especially in places like Florida and Hawaii. Um, but if you look at the numbers there, you can see that in the US, we have a predominance of salamanders, still quite a few frogs. And if we look at reptiles, snakes more than anything else, followed by lizards, and then turtles, and of course, we only have two native crocodiles uh, occurring in the southeast. And if you look down at the bottom right of the screen, this is a, a, a sort of heat map that shows the relative number of species uh, of vertebrates in general, but it's a pretty good indicator of what the pattern is for amphibians and reptiles. And you can see that worldwide, the greatest uh, number of species are in the tropics in northern South America, tropical Africa, tropical Southeast Asia, and where we sit in the US, we're on the low end. Um, we have a relatively low diversity, especially when you get up into the Northeast. So you might think that our diversity in Pennsylvania is, is really pretty low, but in fact, we have 87 species that have been recorded in Pennsylvania, which is not too shabby. Seven of those are introduced, but 80 of them are, are natural. And the, some of the data that I'm going to present in terms of the numbers comes from PARS, Pennsylvania Amphibian Reptile Survey. Uh, and based on their data, uh, that's the number of species that we have. Some of those species, though, seven of those species have not been recorded in the last 10 years. Doesn't mean that they're extinct, but it means certainly that they're at least in trouble. We also have a large number really uh, basically uh, more than half of the total number of species that fall into some conservation concern category, either species of special concern, threatened species or endangered species or candidate species that are being considered for one of these higher threat categories. So we have a pretty diverse fauna, but uh, about half of it is in some sort of difficulty or at least um, we suspect that there are some sorts of serious threats. Where I'm going to go for the rest of this talk is focusing on our area specifically, not on Pennsylvania as a whole. So I've looked at Delaware County, Montgomery County, and Chester County as the three counties that contribute to the main line. And if you look at those, you can see that there's more than 40 species, as well as some introduced species, that occur in each of those counties. And if we put those three counties together, there are actually 57 species that occur in those three counties in southeastern Pennsylvania. That's that's really not bad. If we compare ourselves to most European countries, that's a, a pretty good showing. So how do we get these species? Why do we have the species that we have here? There's several main patterns. One, like you see on the far left, the northern water snake, it's everywhere. So we do have a number of species that are really widely distributed across all of Pennsylvania and often throughout the entire Northeast or the Mid-Atlantic. In the middle, the Atlantic Coast Leopard Frog is typical of coastal plain endemics or species that are limited to larger rivers like the Delaware and the Schuylkill. They tend to have these quite restricted distributions, which are only in southeastern Pennsylvania because of these limitations. And then finally on the right, Pope's gray tree frog is an example of a species that's mostly a southern species and sort of reaches its northern limit in Pennsylvania. And so you see it across much of the southern tier of counties, although not necessarily in the more mountainous parts of the state. So let's say something about the main line. So uh, if I asked everybody here to sort of define the main line, you might come up with somewhat different uh, interpretations of what the extent of the main line is. I decided to go with the main line chamber of commerce. And this is the map that they have on their site. And the area in blue is the area that they consider to be the main line. So that basically is kind of going from uh, Balakinwid westward, taking us into uh, East Whiteland Township. And Radnor Township, where Villanova is, is sort of in the middle of the main line. 
Importantly, because it affects the number of species that we have in the main line, this interpretation of the main line inc includes Valley Forge. Uh, and there are some species that only reach the main line uh, in Valley Forge, for example. Now I've got a, a photo of Edward Drinker Cope here. Cope was the most important herpetologist in the US in the 19th century. And the reason why I have him here is his first job was teaching at Haverford College. So at, uh, in the 19th century, the main line was in fact the, the center of activity for herpetology in the United States and the entire country. Um, Cope later went on to, to teach at Penn and to work at the Academy of Natural Sciences, but uh, he began his career out in Haverford. So I'm gonna jump right in now to talk about the different groups that occur in Pennsylvania. And I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail, but I'm hoping for those of you who are not already knowledgeable about herps, it'll give you some idea of what the diversity looks like, uh, what some of the interesting species we have are, and I'll say something about the more common species as well. So I'll start with frogs and toads. There are 17 species of frogs and toads in Pennsylvania. There are 13 in our three county area, and 12 of those have been recorded on the main line. Uh, and of those 12, eight have been found on Villanova's campus. Uh, seven of those are relatively common in the area. Now you'll see this is a little color coding and different sorts of fonts here. And what I've done here is indicate the species in yellow are ones that are known from the main line. The ones that are in white occur in the three county region, but not in the main line. The ones that are in bold, so if you look up under toads at the top, you'll see Eastern American toad is in bold and Fowler's toad is not. The ones that are in bold are the more common species, the ones you might be likely to, to see. And I've also indicated here SSC for species of special concern, and I've indicated endangered, or you'll see in later slides, threatened or candidate species. So if you see red anywhere, this is a species that has some sort of threat associated with it in Pennsylvania. So we have three families of frogs and toads in our area, toads, tree frogs, and so-called true frogs. And we'll take a look at, at those groups. For toads, we have these two species. The Eastern American toad up on top is the, the common species, the one we find more often. Fowler's toad is in our area, but is less common. I've shown an example of, of what the tadpoles look like for these animals. They're typically quite small and very darkly colored. Toads, as many of you may know, are mostly terrestrial, mostly nocturnal. They have these distinctive large glands behind the eyes. These are the parotid glands, which secrete toxins. And uh, these toads produce trill calls, sort of type calls. Um, they often breed in shallow pools uh, from spring into summer. Um, and you can tell these apart uh, by things like the shape of these parotid glands behind, uh, behind the eyes, and also the relative size of the warts on the leg. They're quite similar. The two species are actually very, very similar, though. For tree frogs, we, it's a bit of a misnomer because some of them are actually aquatic or mostly terrestrial. Um, so we do have some diversity here. They all have some sort of toe pads or toe discs at the end of the fingers that are adhesive. Some of those are quite small and things like the Eastern cricket frog that you see up on the top and that gets its name for the call, which sounds very much like a cricket. Um, there are also relatively small in the New Jersey chorus frog, which is in the lower right. However, the two more common species, the gray tree frog in the upper right and the spring peeper in the lower left, uh, have much bigger toe pads and are, are the more arboreal of the, of the species. Um, some of these, like spring peepers, for many of you will be a, a, a sound. Their call is something that you, you know, may, may know as kind of the harbinger of spring because they start calling relatively early in the season, whereas some of the other, like, like the gray tree frogs, are late, uh, late breeders and they tend to be calling later in the summer. Um, I'll just mention here that there are some wrinkles in what we know about, uh, about frogs and other amphibians in Pennsylvania. There are two species of gray tree frog uh, and they actually look identical. 
You can tell them apart by their calls and you can tell them apart by cell size and by chromosomes, but you can't tell them apart by what they look like, um, which makes things a little difficult because both species actually occur in our area. The last group of frogs are the true frogs. And these are the animals that have long, powerful legs that jump well, they have webbed toes. Um, these include the bullfrog, the American bullfrog, which is our largest species uh, shown up in the uh, upper left, uh, and the green frog, which is our most common species shown in the upper right. Little bit of a misnomer there because green frogs are also sometimes called bronze frogs because they can be brownie or bronze, or banjo frogs because their, their call sounds like plucking of a banjo string. Um, down at the bottom, we have wood frogs, which are really early breeders. They can breed as early as February when there's still ice around. And they're identified by their smaller size and that sort of mask that they have passing through the eye. People often get bullfrogs and green frogs con confused, but an easy way to tell them apart is if you look on the bullfrog, you'll see that this fold that comes behind the eye and goes around the ear and the fold in the green frog extends over the top of the ear and onto the animal's back. Um, so that's an easy way because a small bullfrog can look like a larger green frog. The other two true frogs we have are the Atlantic coast leopard frog and the pickerel frog. Now the pickerel frog is reasonably common uh, I haven't seen it on Villanova's campus recently, but it used to be common on our West campus. Um, pickerel frogs have these squarish sort of markings on their back. They produce fairly noxious skin secretions that, that some predators find, find uh, unpleasant, so they have that as a defense mechanism. The other species, though, the Atlantic Coast leopard frog is a really interesting one because it wasn't described until 2013. You might think, well, we everything in Pennsylvania, all the vertebrates must have been known for a long time. But this is actually a frog that was confused with other species and turned out to be endemic or occurring only really in the area from Connecticut, New York City, down through the Delaware Valley and on to a little bit further south. So it occurs in an area that has a lot of metropolitan area in it. Again, this is a species that uh, I found on Villanova's campus when I first came here 35 years ago, um, it's still in the area, but it's not everywhere. And so it has a, a endangered status in the state. This is a particularly interesting one to look for uh, because we don't really know exactly what its status on the main line is. And in addition to those frogs, of course, because these are animals that undergo metamorphosis, we can tell what's around not only by seeing the adults or hearing the calls, but by looking at things like the egg masses. It turns out that the egg masses of different species of frogs and salamanders for that matter are different. You can tell the species by the type of egg. So pickerel frogs have these big clumps, gray tree frogs have these more spread out uh, egg clusters. And the tadpoles uh, of the corresponding species, pickerel frog on the left and gray tree frog on the right, are also quite different. You can key out or identify what species you have by tadpoles. So even if the adults aren't around, it may still be possible to determine what's living in your backyard. So this is not something I'd, uh, that I expect people to digest immediately, but because this will be recorded, maybe somebody who has an interest in the frogs in their own property uh, might find this useful. This is a, a frog and toad phenology chart, and it shows you when the main breeding period is for each of the species of frogs here. And so it's kind of a convenient thing. If you start hearing frogs in uh, August, you might look at this and say, okay, who is breeding uh, at the peak in August? And it'll be things like the gray tree frogs, the green frogs, which breed uh, for quite a long season, and American bullfrogs. On the other hand, if you hear frogs calling in February, it's in this area almost certainly going to be a wood frog. So let's move on to salamanders. 24 species of salamanders in Pennsylvania, 13 in our three county area, nine on the main line, and six of those can be locally common. And we have uh, uh, three different families, embistomatids, which are mole salamanders, which we don't see very often because they spend most of their life underground. You see them when they're out going to their breeding ponds. 
the one species that's been recorded on the main line is the spotted salamander. At the bottom, salamandrids, which are newts. We have one species of newt, uh, the red spotted newt. And then plethodontids, which are really interesting because they are lungless salamanders. They're the only major group of terrestrial vertebrates that are completely lungless. And these animals get all of their oxygen exchange, all their gas exchange through their skin. So uh, they tend as a result of that to be kind of long and slender. So they have a large surface area across which that gas can, can be transferred. And as you can see, we have a number of species that occur in the, in the main line, all the, the yellow ones. None of those plethodontids are currently considered to be major, uh, a major uh, peril in terms of conservation, uh, but that might be changing. But it includes the more common species, most of the more common species. So here we can see a mole salamander, a spotted salamander up in the upper left. As I mentioned, they spend most of their life underground. They breed early in the spring and they often migrate um, to breed. So uh, if you're out on the right rainy night early in the spring, you might find numbers of salamanders that are on, their, on the move to their breeding ponds. On the right, we have our, our one newt, the red spotted newt. Uh, they produce uh, potent skin toxins. Uh, not quite as potent as some of the Western newts in North America do, but uh, still quite uh, quite toxic secretions. So if you handle those, you want to make sure that you you wash your hands. Um, the interesting thing about them is that the juveniles, which start life as larvae living in the water, metamorphose or change into the red F stage, which you see on the lower right. So this is a juvenile stage, which moves out into the forest, will be in the leaf litter, uh, and then later on changes again, transforms again into the adult that you see on the top right, which goes back to the water and will be reproducing again in an aquatic environment. So they have this interesting additional life stage that we don't see in most other, uh, most other salamanders. The lungless salamanders, which are the biggest group, not only here, but in the United States, and they account for more species than any of the other uh, families do worldwide. These are the ones that respire through their skin. Uh, some of these have typical indirect development. That is, they have a larval stage like a tadpole that lives in the water, but other ones have a uh, direct development where they undergo that metamorphosis inside the egg and they don't have a tadpole stage. The ones that I'm showing on this slide are ones that have the indirect development. So they do have uh, free living, free swimming larvae. Many of these species are associated with seeps, springs, or streams. Dusky salamanders, uh, for example, occur widely on the main line. Um, we have them on Villanova's campus. Um, uh, they're uh, spotty in some regions, regions, and they will respond to water pollution. So you will lose them at least temporarily if, if there's a poor water quality. On the other hand, things like the red salamander, they're probably our most spectacular one that you see down in the lower left. Uh, it's also on the main line, uh, but it likes seeps. It likes a particular sort of, uh, of type of water where you will find it. And I've shown you the larva there on the right, the adult on the left. Uh, but they're very patchy because if you don't really have seeps or springs, you're not going to find them. Uh, many of the other species, though, uh, can use a variety of seeps, springs, or creeks and streams. These are other species with indirect development. The northern two-line salamander up on the top is uh, top left is another common species. Um, we were out yesterday and uh, and found uh, one of these, so they're uh, they're happily enjoying their streamside life. Um, the other ones, the eastern long-tailed salamander, which is a close relative, um, is a really striking animal, but it has some more restricted sort of environmental requirements. They're often found in road cuts or caves, or if you have shale banks uh, or around springs. And the one on the upper right, the four-toed salamander, prefers forests with bogs, uh, marshes, or wet meadows. And so that's a much more spottily distributed species. And it's one that if you don't know where or when to look is very rarely seen. The two salamanders here 
are additional lungless salamanders. These are ones that have direct development. So no larvae, all of the development takes place inside the egg. And on the top is the Eastern redback salamander. And you might say, well, the one looks red, but the other one doesn't. They come in redback and so-called lead-backed forms that are often found together. Uh, again, we were out yesterday and found uh, found uh, one of the lead back um, individuals, uh, but these are these are still quite common on Villanova's campus. It's the most common terrestrial salamander in eastern North America, and this is the one. When I said at the introduction that they can have a huge biomass, there was a study that was done in New England that showed that the biomass of this species exceeded the biomass of all mammals and birds that co-occurred on a plot in uh, in southern New England. So these can be incredibly numerous in certain places. The other salamander here, the northern slimy salamander, which is aptly named because it produces a very sticky secretion if you handle it, is restricted more to denser forest and they often like hillsides. It's patchy along the main line. Uh, they're not easy to find in our area, but they are relatively common, for example, further south in Chester County and in some other areas that are nearby. So let's move on to reptiles. Uh, 17 species of turtles in Pennsylvania, 13 in our tri-county area, 10 of those have been recorded on the main line, and four of those are reasonably regularly encountered. We have soft-shelled turtles, one species, we have snapping turtle, one species. We have imidids, which are aquatic and box turtles, which account for most of our turtles. And as we'll see, most of them are primarily aquatic, but not all. And we have mud and musk turtles. So again, all of the yellow ones occur on the main line or have records from the main line. The ones that are in bold are the more common species. And you can see here that we've got three species that are of special concern, two endangered and one threatened. So turtles are a group that we need to keep an eye on. So here we see representatives of three of those families. We have the spiny soft shell in the upper left. We have the Eastern musk turtle in the upper right and the snapping turtle down in the, the lower left. Soft shells have weird biology and weird morphology. They have flexible shells, unlike other turtles. They have these very pointed little snouts. Um, they're mostly carnivorous, and they appear to be introduced in eastern Pennsylvania and expanding their range. In the last 30 years, their range has gone from a very small area in the extreme southeast of the state to, uh, to include many, many counties. They are native in western Pennsylvania, but in eastern Pennsylvania, they appear to have been introduced. Snapping turtles are the biggest reptiles that we have in Pennsylvania. I'm sure many of you have seen uh, snapping turtles either in the water or occasionally out and crossing the roads. Um, they are typified by these very large heads, long tails. The plastron or the ventral part of their shell, the underside of their shell, is quite reduced. It gives them quite a bit of limb movement. Uh, and they're largely omnivorous. Um, and they, uh, when I moved to Pennsylvania, um, you could, with a Pennsylvania fishing license, collect an unlimited number of snapping turtles. And thankfully, things have changed. Um, but snapping turtles were, for a long time, considered a food item. Uh, and people were allowed to collect what they could because they were using it for, uh, for their own consumption. The little musk turtle is very, very small and has a pretty distinctive little shell. It's an oblong, high-domed shell. Um, relatively uncommon on the main line. There are a few places where they where they do occur, but relatively uncommon uh, and often difficult to see. They like to walk along the bottom under the water. They don't bask as much as many other turtles do. The other aquatic turtles we have here, these are four species, one of which is introduced and that's the pond slider. Uh, there are two different subspecies. The more common one that people know is the red-eared slider. Uh, and that is an invasive species that is actually native to the area a little bit further south. Uh, but the other ones are native. On the upper left, you see painted turtles, and that's by far our most common native turtle. Uh, and below, you see two less often encountered forms, the northern red-bellied cooter, which is quite a large turtle, uh, but it prefers uh, uh, larger lakes and 
uh, larger rivers. So in our area is a bit more restricted. The Northern map turtle, which is called that because the juveniles have a quite a complex pattern of lines on their shells that sort of look like a map. Uh, they're also quite limited. They like big rivers. So you see them in the Schuylkill and you can find them in the Delaware, but you're not really gonna find them uh, getting into other areas. I've included them here because where the Schuylkill passes south of Valley Forge, you do have populations of these turtles. And then we've got the kind of three turtles that are a little bit different than the other so-called aquatic turtles. Two of them are very tiny, and that is the bog turtle, uh, which is an endangered species on the upper left, and the spotted turtle uh, on the lower left. Um, and these have very specialized habitat types um, that, again, involve things like bogs and wet meadows, the like same kind of places where that uh, four-toed salamander occurs. So these animals have a pretty restricted, very patchy sort of environment in our part of the state. Um, they do occur, um, but uh, especially for bog turtles, which are endangered, the localities where they occur are generally uh, not made public so that the animals can be protected. These are animals that people like to keep as pets. They're attractive little turtles. And, and uh, uh, so to keep the, the wild population safe, it's probably better that uh, there's not uh, general knowledge where all the populations are. The other one on here will be more familiar to many of you, and that's the eastern box turtle, uh, which is the most terrestrial of all of these emited turtles. Um, and it has a very high domed carapace. All the other ones that you saw on the previous slide have a very flattened hydrodynamic sort of a carapace. But these guys have this high domed carapace and their plaster on the underside of the shell is hinged so they can withdraw their head and their limbs and close that up. Um, box turtles are uh, of special concern in Pennsylvania, but you do see them. I still see them sometimes on my drive to work. Um, on Villanova's campus, I have not seen live box turtles in recent years, but I found two skeletons um, that were not that old. So uh, they, are, they are still in our area. We'll move on to lizards, and lizards are easy. There's eight species of Pennsylvania. Four of them are native. The other four are introduced. Five of them are known from Chester, Delaware, and Montgomery counties, but none occur on the main line. So we have the Mediterranean house gecko, which is in the upper right, and next to it on the upper left, the Italian wall lizard. Both of those are European Mediterranean species. Uh, we do not have these uh, here on, uh, in, on the main line, but they have been introduced, especially the uh, Italian wall lizard is an attractive, nice animal with some bright green on it, and it's been introduced on purpose by people into their yards, into their into the area around their houses. Um, on the other hand, the Mediterranean house gecko is an animal that gets moved around with things like boxes or uh, or uh, lumber or uh, things that are being transported. It was introduced into the United States about 110, 120 years ago in Florida. It's now in about 30 states. And that includes Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. So this is an animal that has figured out how to survive in our winters that it never would have seen in its native habitat. The other species, the other three that are known from the three county region are all native to Pennsylvania. And that includes uh, one uh, species of phrynosomatid lizard. That's the fence lizard. That's the one in the middle. And then below are two skinks the broad-headed skink on the left and the five-line skink on the right. There are spotty records and there were records relatively close to the main line, but those records are all more than a hundred years old. Um, so these animals were never very common in our part of Pennsylvania. Uh, they're more common if you go further west and they're more common if you go to New Jersey, uh, but they are sort of scattered around, but you're, you, aren't going to find them in your backyard if you're on the main line. Although eventually you might start finding the wall lizard and the house gecko because they are being moved around either on purpose or not. All right, so we're on to our last group, which are snakes. And there are 21 species of snakes in Pennsylvania, 13 again in our three county area, 11 on the main line. 
Seven are relatively common locally, and six of those actually occur on Villanova's campus. There is one venomous species, and I put Valley Forge there because that's really the only place you're likely to encounter that species is in Valley Forge. Um, so that includes non-venomous snakes, which make up almost all of these. And again, the ones that are in bold are the ones that are more likely to, to be found in our area. And then at the bottom, we have vipers, and we have one pit viper here, which is the northern copperhead. So these are the, the larger snakes that we have. We have black racers, eastern rat snakes, and eastern milk snakes. And I put the juveniles of the rat snake and the black racer on here because the juveniles don't always look like the adults. Uh, so you might see a snake, for example, that looks like a milk snake, but the colors aren't right. It doesn't have red on it. That could be a juvenile uh, eastern rat snake. Um, so there is some change over time in the, in the coloration pattern of these animals. These are larger snakes. The, the rat snake and the racer in particular can get quite large. Um, the rat snake, as the name implies, is a big uh, uh, predator of rodents. Um, the black racer is also uh, going to take uh, some of these, uh, some of the rodents in the, in the area. Um, we have uh, all three of these on Villanova's campus. Um, the milk snakes stay put a little bit more. The rat snakes and the racers probably cover a bit bigger area. So the ones that we have on campus, probably those same individuals, if you live near campus, near Villanova's campus, may be moving during certain times of the year onto your properties as well. All of these are completely harmless snakes um, and uh, are, are things that you should enjoy seeing when you see them. Don't, uh, don't react negatively to them. Uh, two other snakes we have, one common, one not common. The common one is the northern ringneck snake. You can tell why it's called that. It also has a very distinctive belly, a kind of yellow or orange sort of belly. We have these on Villanova's campus as well. These are pretty secretive little snakes. Uh, if you are just walking around bird watching, let's say, you are unlikely to accidentally run into these. Uh, but if for some reason you're moving around leaf litter or flipping logs or rocks, you might find these animals. The other one is the eastern hognose snake, which is sometimes mistaken for a venomous snake because it does this sort of head flattening, makes its head triangular, looks a little bit maybe like uh, some venomous snakes, but it is totally harmless to humans. Uh, I've shown two individuals here, one with a relatively strong pattern and one at the bottom, which is a melanistic or one that is, is totally dark in color. Uh, they are uh, peripheral to the main line. There are a few very old records from the main line itself, but mostly uh, these are uncommon. More common as you get out towards Lancaster or Lebanon counties out in that way. And uh, this species is known for death feigning. And on the far right, there's a photo of one of these that's death feigning. That is, you disturb the snakes and they turn over and play dead. Uh, and then if you pick them up again, They'll move around and turn over and play dead again, um, which apparently might work for some predators, but most humans would recognize that the animal is, in fact, still very much alive. These are natricine snakes. These are mostly snakes associated with water, although not entirely so. And these all have keeled scales. The scales on the body have a, a a large keel that runs down them, or a bridge that runs down them. They incur, include the two most common snakes that you're going to find on the main line, which would be the eastern garter snake up in the upper right and decay's brown snake down in the lower left. And the decay snake uh, might be more common than the garter snake, but like the ringneck snake, it's one that's pretty secretive and very small. So it's one that you may not may not see as much as something like a garter snake. The northern water snake uh, that is shown up in the upper left is also very common. Um, uh, we don't have those, or I haven't seen them on Villanova's campus, um, but they are very common wherever there's maybe a little bit more permanent water. They are very aquatic, as the name implies. The other two species on the lower right are much less common locally. Uh, the queen snake um, is a snake that eats crayfish primarily. Uh, and it is pretty limited in our area, but it does occur uh, in some good numbers close by in places like Great Marsh. 
um, and the Eastern Ribbon Snake, which was on Villanova's campus when I moved here 35 years ago, but has now become uh, a species of special concern in Pennsylvania and is less common, uh, and especially in our area of Pennsylvania, uh, is less common than it used to be by far. And then finally, the last species, before I sort of wrap up and say a little bit in summary, is the only venomous snake in our area, and that's the northern copperhead. Um, it's the only one that makes it to the main line, the only one in our three-county area. It is a pit viper, and that means that it has a heat-sensing se pit between the eye and the nostril uh, that it uses to identify uh, warm-blooded uh, prey. And uh, what I always tell students is if you're if you're old enough to have ever seen the movie Predator, the Predator kind of sees the world in a heat vision kind of way. And something like that is probably what these animals are doing when they are looking at prey. They certainly have good vision as well, but they're integrating that with a heat version of what the world looks like as well. These snakes are relatively heavy bodied. They have a triangular head. They have elliptical or vertical pupils, which uh, you don't see in things like that hognose snake that sometimes is mistaken for, uh, for a venomous snake. Uh, they're often associated with rock piles, outcrops, or ledges. They need those uh, sorts of elements in their environment to sun themselves, to bask, and also uh, in order to, um, to uh, overwinter, to get into a denning site. Um, locally, they're basically limited to Valley Forge Historical Park. Um, there are a few records outside of Valley Forge, but I'm not aware of any records in my lifetime, really, that would have extended very much out of the Valley Forge area. Um, in case you're wondering about, you know, do I need to worry if I go hiking in Valley Forge? Copperhead bites are painful and they can result in local necrosis or swelling and nausea, but the effects are generally not life threatening. That's not to say that nobody has ever died from a copperhead bite, but generally, uh, the people who would be at serious risk would be very young, very small children, people in some sort of uh, uh, frail condition. But for the average person, a copperhead bite is a very painful reminder to uh, to not put your fingers too close to snakes that you don't know. Um, but they're not uh, typically a, a deadly venomous snake. Virtually all of the local sightings, so in the time I've been at Villanova, Every call that I've ever had from somebody who took a picture and thought they had a, a copperhead um, turned out to be the northern water snake. Uh, so only in Valley Forge um, do you get sort of legitimate records of this. For the most part, if you live on the, on the main line uh, and you're not at Valley Forge, uh, probably if you see something that you think might be this, it's probably... Uh, young water snakes, which still have a, a quite, quite bold pattern on them. So since this is the Oakwell series, I wanted to give a kind of summary slide about how this kind of ties in, what our diversity of amphibians and reptiles, what it says about what we might expect at some place like Oakwell. So the main line actually supports, or at least recently in the time that I've lived in the area, has supported 42 species of amphibians and reptiles. That's not bad. 12 frogs, 9 salamanders, 10 turtles, and 11 snakes for a place that really is best described as suburbia. Um, that is not a bad diversity of amphibians and reptiles. 21 of those species, half of those species, have been found on the Villanova campus. That includes eight frogs, three salamanders, four turtles, and six snakes. Some of those are now gone. Some of those I have not seen, certainly, in recent years, but some of them I did see early on, and some of them I only found for the first time in, in the rel relatively recent past as well. So that tells us something about amphibians and reptiles. You can't go out and spend a day or a week um, surveying and feel that you've got everything that's there. These animals are largely inconspicuous, and you need to spend a lot of time spread out over the activity period of the year in order to be sure that you, you know what you actually have. So most of the 21 species that have been reported are more or less generalists. And many of those are probably should be occurring at Oakwell. 
the ones that occur on Villanova's campus should probably occur at Oakwell or in the past will have occurred there because it's a tenth of a mile away from Villanova's West Campus. And our West Campus is where most species of amphibians and reptiles have been found. So most of those 21 species are not on the main campus where the academic buildings are, but they're on the West Campus where there's a little bit of forest, there's a meadow, there's a creek, um, there's some sports grounds. They're not on those, but they're they're on the West Campus in general. I checked on iNaturalist, which many of you may use, which is uh, a way you can take photographs of animals and it gives you an identification and people post their photos. Uh, on iNaturalist, there are five species of herps that have been reported from Oakwell. That's certainly an underestimate. Uh, almost certainly, if you find it on Villanova's campus, you probably could find it on Oakwell, or at least you, you could have found it on Oakwell. So Oakwell represents a significant asset for the conservation of amphibians and reptiles in the already challenging mainline environment, right? I mean, for, for animals that do best without people in their lives, living in the heart of suburbia is a challenge. And any piece of land that is not going to be converted into something other than habitat for these animals is really something that's going to take away from them. So whatever we can conserve in this area is going to be a real help. So what are the threats to amphibians and reptiles in Pennsylvania and what can we do about these things? So 80 of the 87 species are native. 46 of these are of conservation concern. Six of those haven't been found in the last 10 years and two are considered to be extirpated or locally extinct in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So these animals are in trouble. They are animals that we need to do something for. Left to our own devices, humans will probably squeeze out more and more of these species. Some of the greatest threats are habitat loss due to the drainage of wetlands and the conversion of land for development or agriculture. That's probably the single biggest problem. You lose habitat, you lose most of your amphibians and reptiles. Water pollution is another problem. And that can be watershed wide affecting rivers and creeks and streams or a micro scale. It could be runoff from your yard. It could be runoff from, uh, you know, from uh, the uh, uh, lawn service that you have that, that comes to take care of things. So we all need to be sort of cognizant of the fact that water pollution can be a major effect on these animals. Emerging diseases, chytrid fungus, uh, is a fungus that is, has caused the eradication and even the extinction of frogs in some parts of the world. Um, we do have it in animals that are here. Ranavirus is another amphibian virus that can be transmitted, which is a severe problem for, uh, for species, especially species of amphibians. Uh, and finally, I'll mention competition from and predation by introduced organisms. Uh, so things like feral cats, um, and uh, and dogs that get loose and and uh, decide they're going to eat snakes, these can be a problem. Uh, and of course, that's compounded by the fact that we are in suburbia. So what can you do? What can you do to help amphibians and reptiles? One, you can support efforts to keep natural lands intact and to maintain connections between blocks of habitat. Two, you can help try to keep all water bodies and stream and river systems as clean as possible. That includes trying to minimize your own contribution to environmental toxins. Three, don't kill or disturb herps or damage their refuges. Uh, that is, uh, when you find these animals, only the copperhead, which mostly, again, is in, uh, in Valley Forge Park, uh, is something that is really potentially dangerous, right? So uh, these animals really should just be left to, to do what they do. Disinfect to avoid transferring pathogens. Because we have this fungus and the ranavirus, if you, for some reason, are moving between water bodies or you're handling amphibians, you want to make sure that you disinfect your hands and that you disinfect your boots or anything that you might move from, let's say, a pond to a stream so that you're not transferring any sort of pathogens. And then finally, you can promote herp appreciation. I started off showing you Linnaeus and saying Linnaeus didn't really like amphibians and reptiles. He didn't pay much attention to them. And it's still uh, a PR problem. Amphibians and reptiles are a group that a lot of people don't like. Um, so I would encourage you to 
kind of promote that appreciation of amphibians and reptiles as a really interesting and important part of our environment. And um, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but since this will be recorded, some of you might want to look at this later. Here I've just listed ways that you can observe herps because it does take some special knowledge to know where and when you can see these animals. They're not all going to be out. You might say, I've not seen 21 species of herps in my backyard and I live just down the road. Well, it'll take a while to see that number and you need to know what you're looking for. So I've listed things here that you can do to maximize your ability of seeing things without hopefully disturbing them too much. And I'll just mention one thing in particular is that things like eggs, tadpoles, the shed skins of snakes, those are all the kinds of things that may be evidence that you have animals in your area uh, that you may not see. You may not see those adults, but you might see some evidence of their presence. So pay attention to those and pay, att pay attention to things like frog calls and what time of year they're calling and things like sounds. When you go for a walk, listen for things that are moving in the underbrush. Snakes, for example, all, often give themselves away by moving in the leaf litter. And if you know what to listen for, you can identify them. So uh, that sort of wraps up my little overview of uh, the, the herp diversity, the amphibian and reptile diversity of the main line. I'd like to give uh, some acknowledgments here. paherps.com is a great site. It has a lot of images that I've used here and they were individually credited. That PARS, which has the mapping survey, so you can check and see how many species are known from which counties in Pennsylvania. Uh, my students in my biodiversity and systematics class, every two years, we do a quick survey of the Villanova campus and we kind of keep a running list of what species we found. My colleagues in CBEST, and I'd like to thank everybody who attended for your attention and for your interest in hopefully understanding and lear learning a little bit more about the local animals and in preserving local biodiversity. And I finally will give a shout out to our remaining talks in our series. And I've highlighted in red the talk that will be next week, who's Dr. Sam Chapman, who you saw at the beginning introducing my talk, who's going to be talking about the forest understory. So uh, thank everybody for your attention. Thank you so much, Aaron. So fascinating to hear about all the biodiversity and amazing animals we have right near us. And I think in particular, you know, knowing what we have on Villanova's campus across the road from Oakwell tells us the possibilities of, of you know, what kinds of organisms we can have over there and how important it is to conserve them. So thanks so much for that. And also for the really cool tips and observing herps. I think that's so great to think about the phenology of all the frog calls and I'm going to print that out. <laughs> um, so I think at this point, it's probably easiest if I can, we already have some questions in the chat and some thank yous. So um, Aaron, if it's okay with you, I'll read the questions in the chat to you and then we yep. can go from there in terms of answering them. It's great. That's fine. Um, so the first question is about why does it matter? If you can just talk a little bit why it matters that we preserve herbs. Well, I mean, I think you know, as biologists, um, certainly our perspective, I would say, is all biodiversity matters. You know, it, it's uh, just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there or that it's not important. And as I said, this is these can be a, a really large percentage of the biomass. Uh, and and even though people kind of maybe think of that as being true in the tropics, it's actually even more true in the temperate zones that the the few most common species are really accounting for a lot of that biomass and are really integral parts of all of these sort of food chains both terrestrial and aquatic and if you remove these these components you're really disrupting the entire system you know and uh you know people kind of think about things like apex predators and things like that some of these like snakes many of the snakes are apex predators for uh, for a suburban area like we are. Um, but even the things that are, let's say, further down the food chain, so to speak, have an important role. Think about the biomass of tadpoles, for example, uh, right after frogs or toads have bred. You can go out and you can see ponds that are almost more tadpole than they are water. So um, so those are some of the reasons why I think it it, it matters why uh, why we should be caring about these. Cool. Um, there's a bunch of just kudos on the talk, but the next question is about 
What are your thoughts from Tim Devaney? Um, what are your thoughts on the intricate colorations and patterns of many species of frogs and snakes, especially? It is, it, are these a result of the environment or evolution, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, there, there's actually a lot of study on, on coloration in amphibians and reptiles. Um, and a lot of the things, like if, if you look at something like a, a garter snake, well, you put a garter snake, you know, on on a tabletop, um, it has a certain appearance. You put that garter snake down in the leaf litter and it starts moving and you get a flicker pattern and you as a potential predator might have a very hard time actually finding where is the head on that animal? Where is, where could I grab that animal? Uh, so a lot of it has to do with things like crypsis, even some of the, uh, some of the things that might appear sort of strikingly colored are under some circumstances cryptic. Some of those bright things, uh, like the the red salamander, um, is one that is not itself particularly noxious, but it may be mimicking the red eft, which is noxious. Um, so some of that may be truth in advertising in some cases that these bright colors may be warning potential predators that it's not worth not worth messing with. Uh, and then you also have differences like the the changes that happen in some of the larger snakes, which might be due to changes in who your potential predators are uh, and where you're hanging out. And if you're a six foot long adult rat snake, um, you don't have many local predators that are probably going to be a problem, especially if you're climbing someplace. But if you're uh, a young snake that's much smaller, maybe it's better to have a more spotted pattern or pattern that will blend in better with the leaf litter. So it's really all sorts of complex uh, ideas that that can explain the the patterns and and it is an area of active research a lot of people kind of are actually studying that that's really cool to think about the age of the snake and their coloration um so a couple more questions Aaron if you're game we have a bunch sure. um so um Sean McMurtry is asking frogs are voracious mosquito eaters and most people don't realize that a small wildlife pond is actually a good answer to mosquito controls that right well um actually when we were out yesterday um, uh, my, my visitor from Norway, Tora Kopic, who I think is, is, uh, online from my guest room upstairs, uh, uh, took some photos of green frogs. And one of them, when he looked at the photo, turned out it had a, had a nice mosquito that was full of blood that was feeding off, off one of the frogs. Um, so, uh, they are, uh, certainly frogs, most frogs will happily eat mosquitoes, um, uh, I'd have to have a lot of frogs in in my in my backyard to feel confident about going out and coming back in without any mosquito bites on a on a warm wet summer summer night. But they do contribute to that for sure. Um, you know, I mean, Kel talked last week about bats, and bats are huge uh, consumers because they're endotherms because they have to keep up this energy. They have to keep this high metabolic rate. Amphibians and reptiles don't have that high a metabolic rate. But for the metabolic rate they have, the lower metabolic rate, they still do eat quite a few insects, and, and cl including uh, things like mosquitoes. So they, they certainly are a plus when you have mosquitoes around. There's a question about when the, the recording, so they can share it with some friends, will be available. Usually for Villanova um, YouTube or CBS YouTube channel, it takes a couple of days, but we'll be sure to like put it up on the Grow Oakwell site and et cetera when it's posted. Um, there's a question from Mustafa, Aaron, um, one of our own graduate students at Villanova, which is awesome. Um, Aaron, some of the species you mentioned used to live on the main line, but they don't exist on the main line anymore. Do you think it would be a good idea to reintroduce species that used to live in a certain location but don't exist there anymore? Uh, that's a really good question. And, it's, and it is a, uh, a topic of great discussion for lots of different organisms, not just amphibians and reptiles. You know, what, there's a lot of ethical issues there. Um, you reintroduce something, you are disrupting the genetic makeup of the local population. You might be introducing disease vectors, that sort of thing. Um, certainly with amphibians, it's risky because of chytrid fungus and because of ranavirus. Um, moving animals around is, is a potential problem. It could be done in some areas where we have species that occur in let's say the three county area that once occurred on the main line they're close by 
Um, it might be possible you'd really want to screen to make sure that you were not moving any pathogens around. Um, and under some circumstances, um, the the benefit of of maybe establishing some more stable population someplace may outweigh the negatives the, of the changes you would make to the, the genetic structure, especially if you're moving something that comes from a very close place. But it's definitely not a not a black and white question. It's a it's a, a difficult question to, to answer. Some of these things, of course, are moving in on their own. So I mentioned things like the soft shell turtle, which is expanding without us trying to have it expand, or the the house gecko, Mediterranean house gecko, which is getting where it gets wherever people are moving things. So some of these animals are moving around despite our best intentions. We are still spreading some of these animals. Okay, I think we'll just take this one last question, Aaron, um, mm -hmm. which is, could you talk about the importance of local habitat corridors for herps like in our area? Yeah, I mean, this is a really critical issue for herps on the main line because the main line is so suburban, right? You know, it, it's, it, it has so many housing developments. It has so much in the, you know, you drive down Lancaster Avenue and you have all the businesses and all these major roads that dissect the, uh, dissect the habitat, um, it, it does become important. Um, so on the one hand, for water bodies, for the stream salamanders, everything is connected anyway, right? Because if, if the stream systems connect to each other, there's the possibility of movement. If the stream system is polluted, there's a possibility of losing the animals out of the stream system. But for more terrestrial systems, um, it's especially important for uh, things like the larger snakes, things like snapping turtles, which will travel sometimes fairly large distances over land. Um, the more we have a connected corridor that has a combination of the right kinds of habitat. So you want access to water pretty much wherever you are. You want to be not too far from water. You want to have forested areas that provide protection, that provide a, uh, a sort of hidden pathway for animals to move, but you want to have sun and exposed areas, open meadows for animals that need to bask as well. So maintaining diverse corridors, sort of sort of uh, corridors that maintain two or three types of, of, uh, of habitats that provide for the needs of amphibians and reptiles is particularly important. Many of these animals don't live very adventurous lives and they may spend their their whole lives in a very small area but for the ones that do move around those corridors are going to be especially important um so again bigger snakes are a special concern box turtles are of concern snapping turtles are a concern so some of the bigger more obvious animals are the ones that this is really most important for awesome i want to thank aaron again um Really, it's such a treat to hear my colleagues who I get to hear, to hear talk about research all over the world, talk about some of our local things. And I want to thank the Grow Oakwell people, Aaron and Sean and Julia for and Emma, um, one of our students here at Villanova, for helping advertise this and put this together and to Cal for helping to put it together, too. It's really been fun to hear about this. And so one of the cool things and just wanted to let you all know this is that um, Aaron and Cal and I talked today about some of the ways that we can improve habitats on campus at Villanova for herps as well, which will hopefully trickle out into the main line. So thanks so much, Aaron. And there's lots of thank yous in the chat <laughs> to you about what an amazing program this has been. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming and make sure you tune in next week. Take care. <laughs>